to enable that process of earlier detection and earlier management. And also not to forget that whilst we consider pediatric onset MS to be a disease happening in the first decade onwards of life, there are cases that you will be encountering in the younger age groups. The youngest I have seen of a multiple sclerosis is a two-year-old child from Southern Italy more recently, but there are these younger age groups. And I think starting treatment at the right time with immune modulation, disease modification, having at least considered those options early can make a big difference in the outcome. So we talked about the 2017 revisions and I was going to highlight some key practice points. This is a good place to do some of this. So as per the revisions, one can consider symptomatic and asymptomatic lesions for dissemination in space and time, which means we have a higher focus on gray matter lesions, lesions in the cortex, as well as lesions in the spine, which also means that at the onset of any presentation, which is remotely inflammatory in children, we should be considering an exact brain and spinal cord imaging at baseline at least. And then the follow-up could be a bit more trimmed and attuned to just following the outcome in terms of the inflammatory load in the brain and spine. The other important message from the 2017 revisions is that dissemination in time and space can be confirmed by new or enlarging T2 lesions. So it's important to, to decide how you're going to assess your response because we are not advocating routine and regular use of contrast media agents each time a surveillance or a follow-up is done because it has no added value and it can be potentially dangerous in terms of accumulation of gadolinium in the brain. What happens, therefore, at the level of pathology, and this is a post-mortem specimen which was uh, donated to me by a colleague pathologist, and this is an older person, this is not a pediatric patient, it's very hard to get post-mortem and you know, even biopsy data on this condition, but apart from the plaques of disease that we would pick up in the periventricular white matter, there are lesions also in the juxtacortical white matter and frank cortical lesions demonstrated in parts, more normal appearing cortex more anteriorly. All this cortex here in the temporal lobe is actually brown and basically got lesions in them. Are we able to image this very convincingly? There is an attempt and everyone is trying hard to resolve those little lesions because the actual lesion load is always underestimated if you're only trying to pick up those white matter lesions in the periventricular white matter. So there are opportunities uh, and options available here and it's standard. I mean, at the moment, uh, what is happening worldwide is a shift towards volume flare imaging. Uh, some centers still do a double inversion recovery. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you're doing, but at least it's good to have one standardized system of imaging all the children in the community or the cohort or the catchment area. So at least follow up and comparisons become easy. So apart from the typical lesions that one would pick up in the uh, periventricular and deep white matter, you're focusing really on these little lesions lying around in the cortex of the brain. Moment of reflection, according to you, is the cortex a gray matter structure or a white matter structure? And a lot of uh, times we think that the cortex is a typical gray matter structure. You're right. And these lesions are in the gray matter per se, but don't forget there are axons traversing those six histological layers of the cortex as well, which makes the cortex a bit of a mixture of gray and white matter. Just like the thalamus, another structure which has been traditionally referred to as a deep seated nucleus in the brain. The thalamus is not even one nucleus. It's around six or seven of these nuclei clustered next to each other with a lot of gray and white matter thrown in. And the thalamus does seem to have a significant bearing in terms of the outcomes from multiple sclerosis because atrophy of the thalamus appears to be correlating directly with cognitive decline in these patients. So uh, not just with three Tesla imaging that is kind of in vogue at this point in time in most of the centers, we are even talking about higher field strength magnets to elaborately show these lesions that could not be detected for a good few years using just conventional uh, non-high resolution sequences. <laughs> 
do not forget, and this is more supported in the adult literature again, not just in postmortem, but also on biopsy, that it seems to be a subpeal or a meningeal process where the inflammation starts. And then that kind of transcends into the brain tissue. And that's quite a novel principle and concept to have in your head when you start thinking about where is the origin of the lesion or, or the actual inflammatory or the autoimmune process that's happening. And it does seem to be a cortical disease, a meningeal disease as well. If you could see this next slide of mine, where the subpeal layers of the brain get actively inflamed with aggregations of uh, lymphocytes, both T and B cells. And then that kind of heralds the onset of more lesions within the brain parenchyma, as well as the spinal parenchyma. So it's quite a lot more to know and consider about MS when we think about the disease and not just completely focus on those periventricular white matter lesions. When in 2012, the revisions to the initial 2007 criteria were made, there was a definite change in terms of the morbidities and, and the right shift in terms of early detection. This is something that I keep uh, telling the radiologists as well, because it's important to conclude on your reports by stating that the criteria for MS as per McDonald's have been satisfied or not. It makes a big difference in terms of how the clinicians then read that report and act upon it. Once again, uh, with the 2017 revisions, this was a piece of work uh, submitted and published by our own group here, looking at how the accuracy of detection as well as sensitivity of pickup was improving with the usage of the 2017 recommendations. And that was quite a jump from 67 odd percent to 87 percent. So definitely more accurate. And we would definitely have a trade-off in terms of a reduction in specificity, not very significant, but quite, an, quite a jump in terms of sensitivity in that respect. And this is uh, more of a picture kind of close to your heart in terms of when you decide the decision matrix in your head being, are we going to consider an escalation strategy where we are going to start with a drug which is low on toxicity, uh, but might be low on efficacy as well. And then when do we decide to go? So this could be a bit of an old school thinking like an escalation strategy. You might even now be thinking about inductions where we hit the immune, immune problem hard and then kind of go down in terms of what we might use as maintenance or steroid sparing agent, as one would call it in common parlance. So it's a philosophy, it's a discussion to be had. And I think what is definitely relevant is when you start looking at how the EDSS score, how the new relapses kind of match with the new MRI lesions. And this is a piece of work which was just recently accepted, uh, where we managed to show a significant correlation between new relapses uh, coming down, along with the new MRI lesion loads coming down and if, if it went up, it kind of went up the other way and there was a considerable association with the EDSs uh, improving as well uh, with the reduction in the lesion load on MRI. So there is quite a correlation without delving into hardcore statistics. I think it's important for practice to know that if you can get your scans appearing or looking better, uh, you are definitely going to reduce clinical relapses and the EDSs will be favorably impacted. Key message, however, remaining from that cluster one is that pediatric MS by and large is a relapsing remitting disorder, I would say 97% of cases. Early diagnosis guides early an effective intervention. And of course, for the radiologists, once again, if the criteria is satisfied, stated clearly. What are we going to do next? Uh, we are working, uh, in fact, this has been accepted already in terms of how imaging should be attuned, not just at baseline, but on follow-up. And these guidelines were initially to be the magnets only, but at the moment they have been joined up with the American authorities as well. So there's an international guideline being released shortly in Lancet Neurology, which is going to look at um, the whole idea of getting a very good baseline. This is relevant to pediatric practice where we do a brain and spine and contrast because in pediatrics, relapsing demyelinating syndromes can have quite a differential diagnosis and the phenotypes can be quite diverse. And then on follow-up, once we know what we're dealing with and we've given the right kind of treatment to start, the follow-up can be quite trimmed using pretty much just a 3D flare. We don't need to do the entire shebang. We try to image children as quickly and as shortly as possible. Talking about relapsing uh, demyelinating syndromes in children, it will be relevant to look at this case here. 
still a child. This is a 14 year old a case which was gifted to me by colleagues uh, in India in the, um, in the Nimhans, which is a big institution in the south of India, of this child who presented with lesions looking like this, recurrent seizures, as well as uh, encephalopathy. And uh, in this particular instance, what you have is a pretty unilateral change in the brain and pretty tumefactive or swollen appearance of this lesion here, for instance, large patch with splaying of the sulcal folds. And then when you give contrast, uh, you pick up the breakdown in the blood brain barrier with nodular enhancement in these areas. It's very different from the ring or the broken ring of enhancement that we pick up with standard MS kind of demyelination. This child also had clinically and on imaging on diffusion sequences very nicely shown along segment of optic neuritis uh, on the right side. And then you start wondering about inflammatory processes. But in fact, this child was also considered as tumor factive and whether we were dealing with a diffuse glioma of some sort. So the center using its advanced imaging prowess decide to do some spectroscopy as well as perfusion, both useless tests in my humble opinion, take it or leave it. Uh, in pediatrics, the advanced imaging techniques have very limited role in terms of diagnostic problem solving. And essentially because this represents nicely a pitfall of spectroscopy where the choline is elevated in a lot of inflamed tissue. And when you pick up a high choline, for instance, you are tempted to call this uh, a tumor. And then this actually led to invasive biopsy and that turned out to be a demyelinating problem. And we're gonna see in a moment which demyelinating problem. So hold your horses. This is a companion case of a three-year-old girl who was due to travel to Bangladesh. And this was the year 2007. This is even before the 2011 case that we saw earlier on. So the history and the imaging is even more primitive. Given a cocktail of vaccines, post-vaccination phenomenon presents with bilateral optic neuritis. And then in addition to the optic neuritis, what you pick up is a patch of very non-specific lesion change next to the caudate nucleus on the left on these axial flare scans. I mean, nothing else apart from an encephalopathic child who's post immunized presenting with optic neuritis. The year is 2007, uh, long before the advent of anything known currently. And therefore, these are tales of endurance, as I did mention earlier on. The child is very encephalopathic and very young. So here we go, presents in 2009 after that and repeat episodes with multiple, in fact, multiphasic ADEM-like episodes. Uh, and, and these lesions are essentially relapsing and remitting in their own way. Uh, new ones appearing, uh, more confluent appearing in parts, old ones going away. And again, you see a further lesion here, the old one gone away. Lots of lesion in the posterior fossa, confluent in the cerebellopontine regions, as well as the cerebral peduncles. And on contrast, you pick up a very similar kind of nodular enhancement that you saw in the case from the south of India that we just looked at in a 14 year old. The fact is that if you were to look at this ensemble here, you're gonna call this a relapsing remitting disease. And it was in fact called a relapsing remitting MS, even though the phenotype was not very typical. Uh, and this is the trajectory of this patient's journey. Uh, two years of pulse steroids followed by initiation of interferon for a diagnosis of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, shifted to rituximab, further steroid pulses in 2016. The child was three when they presented and at the age of 12 at 2016 AD, the child was given IVIG for the first time in their lives. And now they are 12 and able to speak, comes to the clinic on a follow-up after being given IVIG. And essentially they say that we have never felt so good in our life before. And this is Dr. Hemingway's clinic who is one of our pediatric neurologists. So this is paraphrased exactly how it was mentioned in one of the letters on EPIC, which is the electronic hospital record system. The brain is scarred. There is volume loss in the brain, but this made a big difference to their well being, so to say. The treatment which was given for multiple sclerosis was potentially wrong. What were we treating? It was only in the year 2015 in a lab in Oxford in the UK, the MOG antibodies were discovered. 
And ever since the discovery of the MOG antibody, we realized that all the children, nearly all children presenting with multiphasic or multiple episodes of ADEM actually were MOG myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. Uh, that was the uh, demyelinating trigger rather than them being multiple sclerosis. So we would suspect myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein associated disorders in the context of ADEM at onset, multiple episodes of ADEM, children who are younger, and to be remembered that in the context of MOG, the times to relapse are longer compared to multiple sclerosis. Some more companion cases, whilst we are on the MOG theme, I did tell you that there is a high lesion load in the posterior fossa, quite confluent in the cerebellopontine angles. You can have changes within the pontine transverse fibers as well. Um, and not much change or can actually completely dissipate over time as well. Uh, if you give contrast, you pick up a very nodular kind of enhancement. It's not exactly a broken ring of enhancement. You can get more blobby enhancement out there. Again, a typical location. The other patterns with MOG are those of an ADEM-like presentation, as is expected, where you pick up uh, subcortical, cortical, uh, diffuse, confluent white matter changes, which could be fairly symmetrically involving the brain as well. Or you can have an encephalitic pattern, which is, in fact, could be diffusion restricting as in this case, uh, or in another companion case, you have bilateral, fairly symmetric, acute encephalitic presentation, and you're tempted to call these as primary viral encephalitis before the penny drops. Some more uh, phenotypes here, and this was the first cluster that we published as a leukodystrophy mimic of MOG. Uh, that's kind of ancient news now. But if you just focus your attention on case number five, for instance, it does this typical thing of flipping from deep gray matter structures, or I would say primarily deep, deep gray matter structures. This is the basal ganglia and the thalami out here. And over time, flipping to involve the white matter of the brain. Gray matter primarily involving the white matter later on. And again, it is all a relapsing remitting pattern if you think about it, but um, this phenotype is not that of multiple sclerosis. This is distinct and different. In fact, in certain entities, like in this case, it might even mimic conditions like X-link adrenal leukodystrophy, or in this particular instance, an anterior predominant leukodystrophy, which you would see in conditions like Alexander's disease, for example. So before we label things metabolic, just because they are symmetrical, think about MOG and get the right test done. But also remember that relapsing remitting patterns of MS should be discerned from the wider pattern of a relapsing demyelinating syndrome, which is seen in all the sub-entities that are associated in the spectrum of neuromyelitis optica, spectrum disorders, and everything else. Right, so once we have looked at some MS and MOG, we have to kind of stray into some unknown and uncharted territories. With this case, for instance, this time a much younger child, just under two years of age, this girl presented with what clinically was a stroke. Stroke is a clinical diagnosis. A CT scan as a primary emergency modality of imaging was done. And uh, based on the patch of low density picked up, people said this is stroke and nothing else. If you think about the case back here, I know we are in an inflammatory talk, but you know, the, if this is an infarct, then this is cytotoxic edema. And if it's cytotoxic edema, it's not really causing any local mass effect on the ventricles. And if this is an infarct, where the hell is it? It's not really involving the MCA territory. It's not involving the basal ganglia structures. So it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the white matter. So is this an infarct? But stroke is a clinical diagnosis. It's not a radiological diagnosis. And here we go. That is traditional thinking. So the patient gets oh, an MRI scan. And what you would expect to show complete restriction diffusion uh, out there actually is only showing a broken ring of restricted diffusion, broken rings of restricted diffusion, broken rings of enhancement post-contrast agent basically refer to demyelination. It seems to be the phenotype. The child did not have any occlusive arteriopathies shown on the MRI angiogram. And the lesion, even though it's present and it's there, does not have much in the way of mass effect. So it was definitely not cytotoxic edema in evolution. The moment you get a condition of monofocal demyelination, 
then you need to start kind of thinking about conditions like this, like as in the seven-year-old boy who presented with weakness and fatigue and has a lesion, which is a large patch, some other lesions, potentially some cortical lesions out there as well. And you would, in this day and age, label this as a clinically isolated syndrome, given that this is very typically perivenular in distribution, this particular lesion. And, you know, you've got your typical two or three lesions, weakness and fatigue. And, uh, you know, you're going to call this clinically isolated syndrome, and you're going to check the oligoclonal bands, because, because could this be MS, or how does it herald the onset of multiple sclerosis? When do we start uh, disease modification or DMARDs in a seven-year-old with weakness and fatigue with a couple of lesions in the brain. So the moment you pick up the oligoclonal bands, and this is coming from a radiologist, so take it with a pinch of salt, we're looking for evidence of primary CNS demyelination, which means that the bands will be present only in the CSF and not in the serum. And a very simplistic approach, if you can confirm primary CNS demyelination, then it becomes relevant to get that information because as per the new practice points in 2017, and patients with typical clinically isolated syndrome, demonstration of CSF specific oligoclonal anti um, bands allows the diagnosis of MS to be entertained. Now, it's more difficult in children at the age of seven to make a diagnosis of that based on bands and a clinically isolated syndrome alone. Luckily, CIS is rare in children, but in adults, you will see a lot more CIS kind of presentations. And when the bands are therefore positive in the CSF, I think it's quite relevant in terms of starting the right kind of treatment. So very, very important because once you've decided what is CIS uh, and you know what could be the onset of MS, you come across conditions like this. And if I were to ask you for a good example of an MS kind of scan that you can lend me for my book chapter, you probably will give me this case and say, this is fabulous. This is periventricular white matter lesions, subcortical, juxtacortical white matter lesions, except the customer here is an 11 year old boy who's presented with only headaches. This was supposed to be a reassurogram and nothing was found apart from these lesions. And nobody knows what to do with these lesions. They look like inflammatory demyelination. Some patients go on to have a lot of invasive tests as well, bands which are negative. Uh, children keep getting repeat scans. Some people label these as migraines. The fact is that this is, in fact, once you're confident along with your radiologists and your discussions and your review of the patient, you're gonna call this a radiologically isolated syndrome. And at this point in time, the only recommendation for RI S is to clinically follow up patients. Which means that um, we've had MS, we've had uh, MOG, we've had CIS, RIS. Let's look at this patient here, another 14 year old girl, previously well, red flags in the family, consanguinity, there is epilepsy in the family as well, and they present in this fashion. And these scans are quite degraded by motion artifact because the child is in a bad shape. This is a typical clinical presentation where they are not in a good shape. They're quite encephalopathic. This child was vomiting quite profusely. And the moment you pick up low sodium levels and you know deterioration, mentation with lesions in the brain like that, you start thinking about, uh, oh, could all this be related to osmotic demyelination? And in fact, if you look at the sodium level, which was repeated, comes back at 150. So there's been a rather quick um, catch up in terms of the sodium levels. It's gone to the other side. It's not hyper hypernatremic at this point in time. The child also has some white cells which are raised, a bit of hike in protein, and nothing otherwise, uh, no culture growth on the CSF and a barrage of tests which only show an ESR which is elevated at 44. So it's very hard to put this picture together still. The, the, the initial diagnosis made was of an osmotic demyelination syndrome, which in itself also is a demyelinating problem. In fact, it's a, it's a myelin splitting that happens in the context of salt water imbalances in these individuals. Uh, typically speaking, and this is another case which is more typical where you pick up pons, uh, it's called pontine osmotic demyelination, demyelination syndrome, or you can get extra pontine, rather symmetrical changes in the brain. So um, this is what this patient was labeled as initially. And um, we were expecting permanent disability. Uh, the child was being monitored, followed up. 
no scans were repeated because nothing was changing for a good while. And then three months later, there was an interval MRI scan, which showed a very distinct and different kind of picture where they had bilateral striatal changes involvement of the basal ganglia structures, the caudate, the lentiform nucleus. And when you see bilateral striatal changes in anyone, you start thinking, oh, this could be metabolic or mitochondrial. Let's go back to the family history. There was consanguinity in the family. The previous changes have gone away and you've got new symmetrical disease. And instantly the radiologist makes a diagnosis on his report of mitochondrial disorder cannot be excluded. And the child is subjected to a barrage of mitochondrial investigations, very invasive, genetic testing, skin fibroblasts, muscle biopsy, everything was negative in this particular incident. Uh, and, and the CSF was repeated as well at this point, and people tended to kind of uh, underestimate the fact that the oligoclonal bands were present in the CSF on this occasion. The focus was on trying to find that elusive mitochondrial disorder, the quest of which is usually quite futile, as we all know in our practices. And the next time somebody tells you this is a mitochondrial disorder, the, the kind of the reparty question that you need to throw back at them is if it is mitochondrial, which mitochondrial disorder would do this? Whilst everyone is catching their heads and fighting over the case, five months later, the child presents with ascending weakness leading to quadriplegia. And this is the first time, this is, this is the first time they have a spinal MR. And this is why we have to change the guidelines and say, any form of inflammatory uh, presentation, do the brain and spine at the, at the same instance as a baseline. But here we have a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis picked up a few months later. And at this point, the acoporin-4 is positive. Now, this was a historic case, as you know, these were not cases that you would encounter now, but if you did encounter now, you would be doing a few tests right away, including acoporin-4 and MOG, et cetera, depending on the facility you're working in. Well, we say that, but we still encounter patients who have not had some basic investigations at the right time. The final diagnosis was neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders, and uh, the child was, who was initially given steroids, and then very quickly steroid sparing agents were started, and they remained pretty well for two years. Now, if you go back to the initial scan of this patient, you will realize that all the lesions in their brain uh, you know, the paramidline lesions, the hypothalamic lesions, all the lesions that we picked up were in areas of high aquaporin-4 expression. So the phenotype is very strong for aquaporin-4 as well. And they typically present with vomiting because they tend to involve the area postrema in the brain where the chemoreceptor trigger zone is in the brainstem or in the medulla per se, which leads to the vomiting episodes. So every time you have vomiting, it's a warning sign image well the brain stem in that area, picking up that lesion would be quite satisfying in terms of explaining why the child is vomiting before you erroneously label these as cyclical vomiting or a migraine equivalent or some esoteric diagnosis like that. But putting these uh, few cases together, I think this slide becomes quite relevant. If a patient looks like multiple sclerosis, whatever be their age, consider multiple sclerosis. If they don't look like multiple sclerosis, if they don't look like multiple sclerosis, think harder and think laterally. On the spinal side of things, MS lesions generally are discrete plaques. You may get a little bit of signal change intervening, but these are distinct plaques. They may be more typically eccentric or just in the posterior aspect of the cord. Cord imaging in the context of MOG, which is what this case is, you can see the pattern of enhancement as well. They are more longitudinally extensive lesions, more typically central cord lesions. You see the figure of eight uh, of H almost. And uh, you can see a high incidence of lesions in the context of MOG in the conus medullaris, the lower end of the cord. Aquaporin-4, the brain lesions are more kind of ill-distinct, non-specific. They present with vomiting because they may have a lesion in the area postrema. It's referred to as the area postrema syndrome. The spinal cord lesions are probably the worst affected in the context of aquaporin-4. You have a large expansile lesion mimicking an astrocytoma as well at times. And then you can also have some soap bubble appearance in the context of aquaporin-4. If you look at the axial, the whole cord is basically swollen. So quite distinct, three different phenotypes here. You don't need machine learning to tell you that. You need the human learning side of things. Uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, MOG and aquaporin-4 three basic relapsing 
dream, uh, relapsing demyelinating syndromes in children. So basically, the first time you encounter the episode of CNS demyelination as suspected, you really should be looking at the brain and spinal cord. And if it's typical of adult multiple sclerosis, you'd make a diagnosis if the, if the criteria are satisfied. If not, you think about features of NMOSD. You look at two antibodies, which is the MOG and Acoporin-4, and you can make those diagnoses if these bodies are positive. And uh, if there are features of ADEM, you must recheck the MOG because it seems to be so strongly correlated. If negative, we're going to put them in the bucket at the moment for the antibody negative relapsing demyelinating syndromes. And we monitor these children effectively. If they relapse, we go back to where we started. Sometimes you have to repeat these tests. Uh, it depends a lot on the criteria or the titers used in the labs also. Okay, moving swiftly to cluster five. These will be shorter clusters. This is a 14 year old boy with a red flag of progressive lower limb weakness, reduced tolerance, and a lot of other things going on in the neurology, which I will let you read. But at the same time, you're hoping to see the picture. Now, based on the knowledge that I have given to you so far, what do these lesions look like? You've got periventricular white matter lesions. They're quite ill-defined. They're not very strong lesions, but there are lesions in the subcortical white matter, spinal cord lesions, uh, you know, rounded off lesions. In fact, they look like multiple sclerosis. And the presentation would have been typical as well for that, apart from a red flag of progressive lower limb weakness. So there's a problem with the progressive side of things here because it's not so far showing a relapsing remitting pattern, but we've got unpaired bands in the CSF. At the same time, the more you do, the more you find the ACE was elevated, the Borrelia JCV titers are positive. So the moment Borrelia has formed, people jump to calling things CNS Borreliosis because none of us have seen many of these put together and everyone gets excited about these diagnoses which are exotic and of course in neuroborreliosis you can get quite a long segment of transverse myelitis in the cord as well except that in this particular case the western blot comes back as negative and therefore that diagnosis is discarded in spite of the titers being weakly positive. The child continues to uh, deteriorate over time and in their deterioration their walking tolerance is going down the fatigue is going up they have been getting repeat steroids, uh, more scanning, the whole body is scanned and the whole body is scanned for a reason uh, because um, people have begun started thinking about other antibodies and other mechanisms of inflammation in the CNS. Uh, and then uh, further lesions start appearing in the brainstem area here. In fact, at this particular point in time, people were thinking that this is some kind of a metabolic disorder. Don't jump to calling things metabolic just because they are symmetrical. And uh, at the same time, though the patient was satisfying the criteria for multiple sclerosis in terms of the lesion type and the relapsing remitting nature of it, the only problem clinically was the progression that was happening. The child failed a trial of beta interferon, and that's quite typical of many children who can't handle the needle side of things. A lot of agents now are oral agents with um, better efficacies as well as better tolerability and compliance. Um, and of course, with supportive therapy, the child got better. But what happened in the meantime was the NMDAR antibody returned as positive. And when you have positive NMDAR, the problem that strikes is people start labeling that as an NMDAR. And um, if you think about the case, this was actually a case of multiple sclerosis right from the beginning based on the phenotype. This was a case of a primary progressive MS. You will encounter in those 3% of cases in your practice, the primary progressive form of multiple sclerosis. Don't kind of get carried away with weakly positive titers of other things, including an MDAR. The, the NMDAR essentially is a neuronal surface um, antigen and the antibody response to it can be created by a horde of events, including primary infections. And just like the NMDAR molecule, which is a large, beautiful molecule, as you see there, on the neuronal surface, you've got many other antigens and you will encounter results coming back as you know, anti-GLI, anti-GAD, anti-VJKC. I'm sure you, you've encountered all these other conditions as well. The phenotype is quite not specific in many of these entities, but the NMDAR seems to have some specific specificities attached to it. And I would like to show you that because in 50% of cases, the scan is normal. And that's a very important message because if you have a normal scan and the clinical context is of a child with acute onset behavioral chain or some strange movement disorder, in fact, the clinician wants to hear the scan is negative so they can make a diagnosis of NMDA and ask for the right test. 
In other instances, you get more of a limbic picture. You can get involvement of rather symmetrical involvement of the deep gray structures of the basal ganglia or even the cerebellum as out here. So limbic encephalitis is a feature out there. And of course, the important thing to remember is that they can be normal in many of these instances as well. A companion case to NMDA is this, where you pick up asymmetric atrophy of the brain, and this was initially labeled as Erasmussen's encephalitis, but turned out to be NMDA positive as well. And yes, it could still very much be behaving like Erasmussen's encephalitis, except the atrophy was not progressive, and the child uh, did not have the clinical phenotype or the electrical phenotype of Erasmussen's. This also turned out to be NMDA positive. These are rare encounters, but I thought I have to put them together if we are trying to figure out um, the differences. What's more relevant is the fact that the at the end point of NMDAR, the, the phenotype can be so diverse that you can completely misdiagnose these entities. If you don't know about the beginning of time as to what happened, this could have been called a global hypoxic ischemic injury, for example. This would have been called an X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy or a unilateral stroke with more global insult. But all these different phenotypes have been encountered with NMDAR as well. And the other and last thing to remember about NMDAR is the fact that it can it can quite easily be triggered by primary other viral infections. So when we talk about inflammation, you know, infectious and para-infectious entities can coexist together. This child who presented with this scan here, swelling of the left side of the brain, and basically there is inflammation going on and uh, comes back a month later with a new onset of movement disorder. And the new onset of movement disorder in the background of gliotic scarring and hemorrhagic necrosis ensuing from the initial herpes simplex viral infection also involves other areas of the brain. There is a diffuse increasing white matter signal abnormality everywhere. You can call this almost like a subacute sclerosing panencephalitis that was happening at this stage, which has been a term that is used specifically for measles, but can happen in other viruses as well. Uh, except that what was happening here, and by the time we actually got to the bottom of this, there's a lot more atrophy and scarring. This is the outcome of this patient. What was happening was initial herpes simplex infection was triggering an MDA activation uh, in the brain, and the NMDA itself was then presenting with a new onset movement disorder. It can happen uh, a month or so later. A strong companion case uh, to this, which I saw more recently, was this one here. And uh, this was also a child who initially had herpes simplex. So herpes is a bad virus to affect the brain. Hemorrhagic necrosis it can cause. So initial presentation, a herpes simplex confirmed, and the child's age was three and a half. Quite a common infection to happen across the world. And uh, more eloquent imaging shows bilateral changes, a bit of early scarring happening around there. And uh, if you give contrast, you know, they've got uh, profuse enhancement in these areas. And this, this is a scan which happened like um, years later, this child represents with encephalopathy when we have this picture. And when we had this sequence uh, with these imaging appearances, we started thinking about what could this be? Is this another infection? Is this tuberculosis or is it a malignancy? Because this doesn't look like HSV. And in fact, on this occasion, the PCR was negative for HSV1 whilst the anti antibodies were positive, the bands were positive in the CSF. So we were wondering what we were dealing with. A biopsy was performed because the child kept deteriorating and this biopsy essentially confirmed the fact that this was a very unique form of a chronic granulomatous herpes simplex encephalitis. And this is where uh, we decided that, you know, this is not just a reactivation of herpes simplex, but this is a chronic granulomatous form where it presents or manifests itself, the immune related changes manifest themselves years later after the initial scan. So two different companion cases. And, and of course the message is that if you see this remotely, think about chronic granulomatous herpetic encephalitis. A few more instances this is more of our kind of mimics of demyelination. So based on the information so far, when a child like this presents, uh, this was labeled as a limbic encephalitis. Even NMDA was considered. We saw an example that looked strikingly like this. The child also had some brainstem changes in the tegmentum as well as the cerebellar peduncles. Based on these appearances, they underwent a lot of tests for infections, para-infectious conditions, antibodies. Um, and then um, the child basically comes back six months later, progressively deteriorating overall. 
And when we repeat the imaging, uh, this is a child from Greece, so we have some select images. The signal abnormality is actually increasing all over the hemisphere on the left, also in the right side. And um, then again, people do a spectroscopy in the hope that it will show the final answer. The spectroscopy shows nothing. In fact, this time it doesn't even show a choline peak. Uh, and this child is followed for another few weeks before somebody says, now it's time we could did a biopsy. We don't know what we are dealing with. But the message is the next time you pick up bilateral thalamic changes at presentation as the primary feature, think about gliomas, especially the histone mutated diffuse midline gliomas. And that's what this turned out to be. And since then, I've gone back and looked at at least a cluster of four or five cases, all of them turning out to be diffuse midline gliomas in the context of um, bilateral thalamic changes. As a companion case to that is this case here. Extensive changes in both the hemispheres. You've got uh, cortical, subcortical changes. Now, if I showed you this case like that, and I said the child presented with ADEM like episode, you would call this MOG. It is a mimic of MOG. And when you think about it being a mimic of MOG, uh, you know, you start looking at the other imaging features. There's a bit of enhancement, okay, a bit of restricted diffusion. Fact is that this patient also did not respond to any of the uh, early inflammatory workup and you know steroids or IVIG. Steroids used to transiently make them better because of the reduction of the edema. And on final biopsy, this turned out also to be a diffuse midline glioma with a slightly different mutation. So important thing is what appears to be inflammatory demyelination, if it's not responding to the right regime, have a low threshold to biopsy it early because you could be dealing with um, a malignancy which can easily mimic a demyelination picture. So that prompted us, these cases prompted us to put together a paper which we have since published in the frontiers, uh, looking at the mimics of relapsing demyelinating syndromes. And I think just for your memory really, um, discrete patterns, you can see it in a horde of other entities as well. The clinical context would be quite relevant. You know, if you think about hered hereditary spastic paraparesis, the clinical context of that is very distinct compared to incontinentia pigmenty. Uh, but there are entities like Notch 3, which you don't even expect in children, they can give you these lesions that look like MS. Then again, we have the short segment spinal cord pattern, and we have decided that the short segment spinal cord pattern is fairly typical for MS compared to NMOSD, for instance, but you can see that also in the context of neurofibromatosis type 1, and this particular entity called the hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH, which is uh, more of an emergent entity now with the advent of uh, targeted gene testing on the perforin granzyme pathway, where you pick up lots of these starry-eyed lesions in the brain, uh, multiple little enhancing drops, um, quite diffuse changes out in the brainstem as well. You can see brain and spinal cord involvement with these punctate enhancing foci in the context of HLH. Both these patients have Griselli syndrome. If you pick up long segment spinal cord pattern, then think about not just acoporin-4, you also think about viral encephalitides like we thought about in the context of borreliosis. Very rarely would a metabolic or mitochondrial entity also give you spinal cord change. In this case, this was a biotinidase and a more rare form. Quite a good pickup of a fibrocartilaginous embolism in the context of what might be a vascular event. The only trick here was to see that the signal from the disc was missing. And this turned out to be a bit of an anterior cord change. And when you have anterior cord changes, think about vascular events. Also remember, and this is one of the final thoughts really out here, that uh, the length of spinal cord lesions depends on timing of the MRI. If you do it early, you might just pick up the area postrema causing vomiting. But if you spend a few days or repeat it or whatever, you will get more extensive changes appearing in the cord over time. This is a case of acoporin-4 NMOSD. Great. So if we have the appetite for the final few things to look at in the con context of neuroinflammatory conditions. We're going to look at clus cluster seven, and we're going to look at this uh, two cases. Both have these particular mutations, and you're wondering whatever these mutations mean. The cardinal features on imaging is that you've got calcification. They mimic torch infections. You can have a leukodystrophy. You can have frank infarcts. 
So when you can't make sense of it and you have a child who's got chill blains, you've made a diagnosis of Ekali Gutierrez syndrome. The thing you need to know in 2021 is that all of these Ekali Gutierrez syndrome entities, all the various mutations in there that you encounter and get the results back on actually are in the context of interferonopathies. And interferonopathies are again, you know, like your cytokine release that happens in the context of COVID, so to say, or even uh, other entities like tumor necrosis factors and interleukins, interferons can also be released in terms of an inflammatory response. And when that goes out of control, you get an interferonopathy or a hyperinflammatory state. And this is genetically driven by an interplay of several of these genetic factors, all of them that have been traditionally implicated in the Acardi Gutierrez syndrome, which means on imaging, the cardinal feature you get is calcification in the brain. There are other entities that can give you calcification in the brain, and this in itself is a neuroinflammatory uh, uh, process. Uh, this, this montage of images of four different cases out here showing four different things, calcification, uh, a bit of uh, patchy white matter signal change, uh, calcification around in the brain, leptomeningeal enhancement, very non-specific when you look at it in its own respect, but when you start picking up the fact that the scalp is deficient or your clinician tells you that there is morphia or scleroderma going on, then you start calling this an oncoup de sabre or the Paris-Rombach syndrome spectrum. And this is not an interferonopathy, but still inflammatory in its own way. Then we have talked about these two entities here. Uh, this is that of... Uh, HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. This is how they present. And I think for effect of dramatic shakeup, I wanted to put this montage here of different time points on this patient who's got a perforin mutation. And uh, this is the phenotype on imaging. This is not like anything that we have seen previously in the talk today, but you get a profound inflammatory response in the brain with frank breakdown of blood brain barrier. It's almost like an immune reactivation or immune reconstitution syndrome that you pick up in the right context. Diffuse white matter signal change and over time profuse atrophy, et cetera, that in, in, ensue. Another mutation here is that of the porphyrin pathway again, where you can get this phenotype, which has been traditionally referred to as a clippers phenotype and you get chronic lymphocytic infiltrates. And these typically were called clippers because they would respond to steroids quite effectively. But every time the steroid stopped, everything would recur back. And both these entities, as you see here, uh, essentially are in the pathway of HLH, um, primary genetically driven entities. You can get a secondary HLH with chronic infections like tuberculosis. But what do you get on histology? It's not confirmatory. The histology is not the right test. You do get frank axonal loss. You do not get a demyelination. You get aggregates of CD3, CD68, the T lymphocytes, quite a hyperinflammatory response. But what you don't get is demyelination. And that is a very important message. The other important message is that histology is not conclusively diagnostic. You're looking at a reduction of natural killer cells, the NK cell, killer cell activity that comes down, or you get a mutation confirmed in this pathway, which is referred to as the granzyme perforin pathway. You're looking at perforins and a few other associated mutations that basically cause the inflammatory cascade. Okay. So what was called as clippers, and if you might have encountered this term, at least in pediatric practice, all our clippers turned out to be HLH in some way, a primary CNS HLH. This is not secondary systemic HLH. These were cases of primary CNS HLH. Very good. The penultimate cluster for our discussion today is the six-year-old boy who presented after chickenpox. And you kind of know what's coming up the moment varicella is mentioned. You have a brain scan, which is showing a bit of a stroke presentation, more um, proximal changes within uh, the basal ganglia structures, a bit of distal change. You can see the associated restricted diffusion. So this is a stroke, basically it's an infarct, but in the context of somebody who had chickenpox six weeks prior to presentation, you're definitely going to consider consider an alternative diagnosis and not call this a, a thrombotic event because it's not taking off the entire MCA territory, even though it seems to be a proximal problem. When you do the MR angiogram, you get a stenosis proximally of this MCA. The stenosis could be anywhere in the circle of Willis, quite typically in the MCA. And um, what you also get is 
not a very typical stroke that's happening. You can get perfusion changes in the brain, which can be quite transient. Important thing to remember is that these things can automatically improve themselves over time. They follow a rule of thirds. A third of them get better in terms of the vasculopathy. A third of them got, get worse, so they need follow-up imaging anyways, and a third of them remain the same. What is this? Is this a form of vasculitis in the context of a previous infection? And if it's a vasculitis, then it's probably inflammatory in nature. What we don't know is, what we don't know is, what is focal cerebral arteriopathy? At the moment, people out in um, UCSF in the States are doing a big trial called the WIPS trial in terms of using steroids in these particular patients. What remains the controversy is that if you end up being with a neurologist in many centers of the world, they're going to call it focal cerebral arteriopathy and not treat it like a primary vasculitic phenomenon or an inflammatory phenomenon. If you end up becoming going to a rheumatologist, they're going to call it a primary CNS angiitis of childhood, and they're going to give you steroids. So that remains a controversy. And I hope that the WIPS study uh, with people like Heather Fullerton, Max Wintermark at the UCSF and um, in Stanford is able to convincingly address this problem. Until then, we are going to deal with the, uh, the terms and terminologies which are very confusing in the context of what exactly is primary angiitis. And a nice paper in the Frontiers Journal last year uh, published about how to approach this entity. It still is quite basic. The important message really to remember is that it could be progressive, non-progressive, etc. But do not make a diagnosis of vasculitis on imaging until you have proven fibrinoid necrosis on your histology. And you know that is the hallmark of vasculitis, fibrinoid necrosis around these blood vessels, which are actively inflamed. Finally, it's the year and time we belong to, and you know this is the COVID age that this generation did not expect to be in, but we are where we are. And we did put together a montage of cases collaboratively picked up from all over the world through the efforts of the American Society of Pediatric Neuroradiology. And I was quite integral in trying to connect centers across the world. And we put a call out. What did we see? We saw stroke-like patterns. We saw ANEC patterns, you know, which almost looks like the RAN BP2 mutation kind of cases that we are we see in younger children. Then we saw the ADEM-like presentation of COVID, new neuritis, which could affect the quadriquina nerve roots as well as the cranial nerves within the brain. We picked up myelitis in the cord. In fact, in certain subset of patients, the myelitis was very aggressive and left a lot of scarring in the spine. Apart from that, uh, we had one or two cases which were triggering off a secondary HLH phenomenon with a microangiopathy in the brain. And in addition, we also had cases of myositis or active muscle inflammation incidentally or accidentally discovered on brain and spine imaging. So quite a diverse subset of things that happen. It's very hard to predict even from what we know as to what stage is causing what. The important thing to remember, however, is that you know we are dealing at the end of the day with a primary infectious and a para-infectious phenomenon. And these four mechanisms, therefore, of COVID-19, coronavirus causing brain involvement and spine involvement, and in fact, synergistically making some of the other existing infections like tuberculosis worse in many of these cases was observed by this group and published as well. So you can definitely read that paper in terms of pediatric uh, COVID and its largest population study so far. Thankfully, it doesn't affect children as much as it does adults, and but something to be definitely worried about and be wary of when you encounter patients coming to the hospital. To close the loop on these cases, I take back my five minutes from Devraj who used it. Are these cases which we talked about and these cases which essentially are movement disorders and seizure-like disorders. I'm gonna play them and tell you about each one's story. Let's start with this case. This is a case of the child who had initial herpes simplex viral infection, comes back a month later after a cyclovir and everything is done, comes back with a new onset of catatonia, quite a severe movement disorder, as you can see, also quite encephalopathic, turns out to be NMDAR positive. This child, a young child, quite encephalopathic, as you can see, very minimal, changes in terms of a funny movement disorder going on out there, but very encephalopathic, very young child. This is indeed a case of MOG or molybdenum or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. These two cases here, 
were initially thought to be a bit of a, an, a, an ischemic insult to the basal ganglia. You can see there's chorioacetosis. You're thinking about a subthalamic nuclear involvement. And this child here who had a behavioral change as well as this movement disorder. And the brain scans were negative. So it was felt that this is going to be a case of uh, limbic encephalitis with an MDA activation. But these remain antibody negative, so to say. And the outcome is quite uncertain in these recent children. And this is another child, basically an older child, presents with seizures and movement disorders, uncontrolled, and finally had significant global scarring in the brain, was a missed opportunity to, for, for an early detection of an MDA. So of all these things, you can see it's a workup, and it's the final outcome is quite difficult to predict what's yeah. happening out there. I would like to... Um, take this opportunity and thank you for your attention from these words from the holy Upanishads from the uh, ancient Indian manuscript and this is kind of closing the story of endurance on these children when we say oh god from ignorance lead me to truth from darkness lead me to light from death lead me to immortality and I wish you all a lot of peace and good luck in these difficult times and I also would like to introduce our certificate course in pediatric neuroimaging, taking this opportunity to reach out to all clinicians out there listening in as well, because we would like to keep uh, our education and learning collaborative between radiologists and clinicians. And we hope we get to see some of you on a regular basis on these various educational platforms. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone out there. I'm going to close my video and uh, stop sharing at this point in time. Very happy to take questions. Can I go with? Yes, Dr. Giri. You're muted, doctor, I think. Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. Want to congratulate you on a fantastic, phenomenal presentation and too much for my adult brain. Okay. And uh, I want to ask you, are you related to Binu Mankat? the famous cricketer of India. First time someone's asking me that on Zoom. Yes, I am. Uh, he was my dad's first cousin. Oh, fantastic. My brother, who is a great cricket fan, will be happy to know that I spoke to somebody related to Vinu Mankar. Thank you again. No worries. I try to use the Mankading myself, but in a different fashion. Right, Devraj, I'm happy to pick up any questions on the chat room as well, but if not, then I will let you get on with your days out there in beautiful New York City. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Kish. Uh, it's looked like someone actually posted, not a question, but uh, it's very happy, like the, say the absolutely wonderful teaching lecture and quite outstanding to say the list. And thank you from Frank Barron and uh, like it's actually right. It was really amazing lecture. And especially for this piece neuroimaging with the spectrum that you covered, it's quite in one hour, pretty much you gave an overall idea of a lot of other different disorders. And uh, thank you, I guess. Uh, I didn't see much, no any other questions. So I guess that's for today. Great. See you all around at some point soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.